Okay. So I thought it might be just useful. I, I'm not sure, obviously, um, how many of you uh, do know a bit of pets. So I have a very brief introduction on, on pet as well. Um, so uh, pet is used mainly in oncology uh, for tumor detection or for tumor staging, but is can be used for many other uh, uh, indications as well. And in, in, there is some interesting work on uh, how does uh, COVID uh, actually uh, uh, change your pet, uh, the, the response of the body that you can measure with pets. So there's uh, interesting work to there. So it, it is um, used for diagnosis and staging, as I said, but one of the interesting things about PET is also that it can be used for uh, measuring how well you're doing and you can immediately check the metabolism of the body as opposed to having to wait for two, three weeks and see if, if everything went better. So uh, that makes it also uh, relevant for drug development um, where it is possible to see much earlier in a trial if a drug is having an effect or nothing at all um, than if you just need to observe it or, or with other modalities where you are waiting for anatomical changes. Um, one of the important things there that it's uh, a very sensitive technique in the sense that you, you, you need to inject a radioactive uh, uh, labeled molecule well, or set of molecules, but you need very few of it to be able to actually see it. So some of those molecules might be uh, very toxic, but the, the amount that you inject is so small that it, uh, it doesn't affect the body at all, uh, which is why it's called a, a radio tracer in many applications. Uh, so this is the example where um, Again, 95 maybe percent of the PET scans in the clinic uh, are used for. Uh, it's a, on the left, you see a CT, a whole body scan. And on the right, you see a PET scan with a particular tracer called uh, FDG, which is a glucose analog. And so many tumors take up a lot of glucose for, um, you know, for being active and, um, being able to uh, grow and uh, therefore they will be taking up a lot of FDG and we can as even uh, non-clinicians it's quite easy to see that there are a lot of things wrong here with this particular patient and so it can be used to um, then decide on the treatment pathway. Uh, so there are many different uh, PET radio tracers around. Um, not too many are used in the clinic, but in, in total there's maybe 100 or 200 or so that have been studied in the, in the past. So the FDG is the most common one, but there is a series of uh, similar molecules related to uh, a beta amyloid and therefore used for Alzheimer's. Uh, there are also molecules that are related to an angiogenesis and or, or prostate specific uh, antigen. So uh, depending on which tracer you uh, use, you will be able to get, well, you will get very different images and therefore being able to study different processes in the body. Um, so this is a, a uh, not to scale drawing of a set of atoms in, uh, in the patient. And clearly there is a red one, which is a bit different. That's because it's a radioactive uh, atom. And at some point it will uh, emit a positron and a neutrino. Neutrino we can't detect. Uh, we can't really detect a positron either. Although we do positron emission tomography. This is because the positron will be traveling around for about one millimeter or so and then it will annihilate with an electron. And um, so it, it, the positron never ex escapes the body. Uh, however, when that annihilation happens, two gamma photons normally are sent in roughly opposite directions, and it is, are those gamma photons that we can detect. 
Now, uh, we can be unlucky and one or both of these photons might be scattering and that sort of gives us wrong spatial information, but uh, most of the time they are uh, on a line, those two gamma photons. So what the PET scanner then does is uh, there is a, a lot of timing circuitry that says, okay, I detect two gamma photons within a very narrow time window. I call that a coincidence and I'll record those. If the uh, timing is larger than five nanoseconds or so, then we know that uh, there are two gamma photons from different annihilations and therefore we are not interested in them. Uh, we don't need a collimator and that makes uh, a PET scanner quite sensitive. Okay, so those are the main type of the sort of the good coincidence that we can measure the unscattered ones. Uh, we can also have scatter, as I mentioned before, you can have two types of scatter. Sometimes they are not detected or, or maybe they are detected. Try and reject the latter via energy window, windowing, but uh, still there is a scatter background. It's, it's unavoidable. So we will need to take that into account. There's another effect which is called accidental coincidences when there are two annihilations happening very close in time and we see two photons in our detector but they happen to be from different annihilations. And that's also a background effect that we need to take into account. So all of these physical effects and when we do image reconstruction we'll need to model them somehow. Uh, and so our normal data is the sum of all of those, right? And we, for a reason that I don't quite know, they're called prompts. Uh, okay, so now what does that data then look like? Well, in, on your scanner, usually they come in either list mode data or histogram data. Um, histogram means that they are put into bins and for you measure for a certain time frame and uh, we also put them as far with detector pairs or combination of detector pairs. We often call them sinograms uh, for uh, reasons that will become clear a little bit later, hopefully. Uh, they can be in list mode data as well, which is just a long list of all the possible events that uh, coincidence that the scanner detected. Uh, so there is a serve program or, or, or class that uh, allows you to go from list mode data to sinograms and at the moment all our reconstructions will work from this uh, histogram data. Uh, it's possible to reconstruct from uh, list mode but currently not yet wrapped into so. In addition to this data you also need extra to be able to get good reconstructions out. Uh, so you need an attenuation image because you want to be able to, uh, to take attenuation and scatter into account. And you also need a normalization information on what's usually called normalization or calibration that has to do with detection efficiencies and so on. So those files you will uh, normally extract from your scanner before you can do reconstructions. And we need to be able to handle all of them. So what are, what are our data after the list mode to sinograms? Well, in, in, in first approximation, uh, you can think about them as projections, as line integrals, because we measure counts between two detectors, and that means the total number of counts would be proportional to the total activity on that line. And you can put them into a sinogram. Uh, excuse me for the, uh, the grid pattern on here. That's a, 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 an artifact of my file format, apparently. So um, the exact reason why it looks like this is not so important, but the first model is that you have line integrals. However, we have attenuation, you have scatter, you have randoms, that changes how your data looks like. And you might have different detection efficiencies or even a whole detector block out, and that you also need to take into account, obviously, otherwise your data will not look very nice. Uh, a lot of the uh, scanners have some kind of gaps between the detectors that uh, you might, depending again on the scanner, it might show as a lot of zeros in your sinograms. If you don't take that into account, images will look horrible. And there is an example of that in uh, the uh, reconstructed measured data uh, notebook. But then finally, the data 
pet data tends to be very noisy uh, for several reasons, but one of the big reasons is that you obviously can't inject too much radioactivity into the patient. So uh, handling noise is uh, the biggest thing you can do in PET. Uh, so you need to have some kind of model for this data, and that we will go through in, in the first week. Uh, our measured data is an acquisition data like it is for MR. Uh, our assumption uh, common in PET is that this is Poisson distributed, so there is a mean of the data, and then you have, if you do a measurement, you just get a random sample from it. It's a count, it's two, three, four, something like that. And uh, to construct the mean for the data, we have an acquisition model that, uh, because we need to take this scatter and the randoms into account, is not just uh, um, some multiplication with the system matrix or so, there is a background term as well. So all of these things will sit in a surf acquisition model and we will need to be able to uh, line, uh, estimate line integrals, but also we need to know, know um, how to model the attenuation and detection efficiencies. And we will need to be able to run, to estimate the mean of the randoms and the scatter and surf can all to all of these things for you. Uh, so this is our general slide on the SURF, on the SURF software architecture. Uh, what is the underlying engine to be able to do all the PET calculations? Well, it is STIR. So I'm going to give you uh, two slides on STIR itself. It's an other open source uh, uh, project uh, that uh, I'm leading uh, as well in this particular case and uh, with uh, a lot of help from other people clearly. And it's a fairly old one, started in 97 uh, and is now uh, Apache 2 licensed since uh, the version 4.1. It actually covers spec as well. So in the near future, the spec functionality in STIR will be wrapped to serve um, and a lot of it is very similar to the pet side, clearly. Uh, we aim uh, to, in both SURF and STIR, to give you uh, quantitative image reconstructions with some caveats. Uh, STIR can do more than what at the moment is wrapped into SURF, and gradually these things are being uh, transported over. Uh, so the support for SURF on the pet side is limited by at the moment, what STIR can do. Uh, we are talking to other people to be able to wrap other uh, PET engines as well, but that will take a while. So and here is a list of some limitations that we have at the moment. Uh, in particular, many people will be asking, well, I have a, a Cigna uh, PETMR, for instance, can do time of flight. Can you reconstruct the data with time of flight? The answer is yes, but it's not on the mainline uh, accepted uh, STIR version yet, and therefore you have to do, go through a lot of hoops to be able to use it through SURF. So we won't be doing that in these three weeks for sure. Okay, so uh, I thought it might be useful to just uh, point you towards a few things that might not be so obvious uh, once you use uh, surf.stir is so sort of the module uh, that handles the pet data. Uh, one is uh, th there's always, once you want to set up a simulation, which we do in a lot of the exercises, there's always a sort of a chicken and egg problem. Uh, how do you specify your scanner and or, or your actual acquisition? And the easiest way to do that is to start from an existing one. So that is a bit weird, but uh, it's also the same on the MR side. If you have a scanner and you do an acquisition, then you can uh, use that as a template for your future simulations. Uh, this is because there's actually a lot of information that, that you require to be able to do a good simulation. Um, we have a way as well to set this up from, uh, if you have a scanner, you need to specify some parameters and that will allow you to create such a template. Uh, but a lot of the exercises just say, I have a file and you start from there. The 
um, what might be confusing is that this it's a, it's really only a template so you there might not even be any sinogram data associated behind that template uh, you just get the geometry and timing and so on from there uh, another uh, restriction is that you can't uh, model any old image uh, in and to put it into your acquisition model and your reconstructions there are some limitations on the spacing between your slices and so again the exercises are set up that you don't uh, feel that but if you would be copying some data from one exercise and an image from another exercise you might get some trouble because of that and it should tell you obviously um, and a final note, uh, Christoph told you for the Gadgetron, you can go and look into a terminal. In STIR, that is usually not the case. On the virtual machine, you can do it, but normally not. However, you can uh, redirect any errors into, into different files, and that is illustrated in the notebooks. So um, uh, if, if you have troubles that the uh, that serve doesn't allow you to figure out what it is, you can go and look into those files maybe and, and ask for help. Okay, so uh, I think you have a, a bit of an understanding on how the course now works and how the notebooks work. So uh, I'm not going to go through detail here of what all of these notebooks do. Uh, this is just a screenshot of the README that you can see if you if you open uh, the README file for every, for the directory, it will show you something like this, or you can look at it on the website. Um, each of these is a notebook that tries to gradually, uh, you know, add extra things on there. And this week we will be able to uh, do some simple simulations with attenuation and so on. Uh, you will be able to reconstruct those. We will just be using the most popular algorithm in PET, but there are, there are more, but that is for next week. And we will also be uh, reconstructing some data from a Siemens MMR or Phantom Scan and uh, show you how the different acquisition uh, uh, model you know, all the parts that you need, how do they affect the images? Uh, that's it, what I wanted to show. Uh, is, are there any questions at the moment? Okay, I see a question. Uh, does uh, serve a law PSF reconstruction? So from uh, the people who don't know the terminology point spread function. So the PET images have uh, fairly low resolution, uh, sits around the five, six millimeter or so. This has to do because of a lot of effects that are happening. Uh, for instance, the positron travels around like you saw, but also your detectors have a finite size. Uh, so there are methods to be able to cope with this. Uh, the answer is that uh, yes, um, SURF and STIR can incorporate this uh, by at the two different ways. One is you incorporate some image blurring in your acquisition model. Uh, I don't believe that's actually illustrated in the SURF exercises, but it can do it. The other one is you can take the detector size into account by uh, using multiple race as opposed to just one line integral you take a lot of them and that is shown in the exercises <laughs>